You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Your host, Michael, on a Tuesday. We are going to be comparing and contrasting revelation and authority in Christianity and Islam. Joined by Louis Dizon and also Farhan Iqbal. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. First, let me greet you, Farhan. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Farhan Iqbal, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I belong to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Excellent. And I want to ask a little bit about that community here in just a moment. But, Louis, let me welcome you. How are you? Oh, you know, I'm doing great. Uh, it's been a pretty busy week so far. Oh, my goodness. It's only Tuesday, I realized. But, you know, um, I've been doing a lot of stuff, you know, preparing for this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, good, good. Everything yeah. going good in Canada, I take it. <laughs> yes. Things awesome. are great here. <laughs> well, it's over here in Louisiana. It's hot. Hot as usual. So that's uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the status here. So far, well, you, you know what? Oh, I'm December, sorry. Man. We'll be wishing you were there. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Every every time it gets cold here, I, I, I wish it were hot. And when it's hot, I wish it were cold. So <laughs> I guess I just need to learn to be content. <laughs> Well, Farhan, let me let me ask you about um, the Ahmadi community. Tell me a little bit about that. How does it compare and contrast with other Muslims? Yeah, so the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is uh, basically a community of Muslims who believe in the Messiah. That would be the shortest definition. Um, so in, in the Muslim tradition, we have prophecies uh, about the latter days, about the coming of a Messiah. Uh, some Muslims believe uh, that Messiah to literally be Jesus Christ, who would return in the latter days. The Ahmadi Muslims, we believe that uh, Jesus Christ passed away a natural death. And uh, in his place, uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, came. He was born in 1835 in Qadian, India. He claimed to be the Messiah in the year 1890. He's basically the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi. So he claimed that uh, in 1890 and he passed away in 1908. So the Ahmadiyya Muslim community uh, basically in the year 1889, 1890s when we started basically as a community within the broader spectrum of Islam. So you would say that there are prophets after Muhammad, is that correct? We would say that we know of one prophet, at least, that was the promised Messiah. His title mm -hmm. is, uh, is a prophet. Um, and we believe that if God deems it essential, uh, it might happen in the future. That is up to God. I see. Okay. And, and Louis, uh, go ahead and um, also introduce where you want to go with this topic and, and kind of take it any yeah. direction that you wanted to. Yeah, so Farhan and I have been talking about possible conversation uh, mm -hmm. topics, and the main one that I want to discuss first is the topic of revelation and authority, because, um, you know, we have many issues to discuss, but uh, all those issues uh, revolve around the question, what do we regard as our main source of authority? You know, all the other stuff that we could potentially talk about in the future, whether it's the nature of God or, you know, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they're all contingent upon where, how do we believe God has revealed himself and, you know, uh, what's our source of authority. And I'm going to present from the Christian angle, uh, of course, but I'm presenting it specifically from a Catholic angle. Uh, of course, you know, there are parts of my presentation that are going to be similar to um, uh, what uh, other groups like the Orthodox and Protestants would believe. And then there's stuff that I will say that are unique to Catholics. Um, Excellent. All right. Well, did um, did you want to go ahead and introduce a, a, a topic of discussion? Yeah. Um, you know, in the future, we were hoping um, that we would also talk about other things, such as mm -hmm. what is God like? 
uh, what do we believe about Jesus, you know, his life, death, and resurrection. Right. Uh, but that's, you know, later on down the road. I imagine right now you're wanting to just talk generally about Revelation yeah. as such. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. So what are some of the differences, I guess, that we might have on Revelation uh, and authority? Yeah, I actually, we were actually talking about doing um, some uh, presentations, and I actually have slides ready to go. So if you like, I can um, pull them up if right you, now. Yeah, if you pull it yeah. up, I can enable it on my end, and you can yeah. share anyth anything that you want to share. Sure thing. Um, and then, you know, after this, um, Farhan can talk about, you know, the same topic from his perspective. All so, right. All right. So... You know, the topic of revelation and authority is very important because it tells us how has God revealed himself to us and who gets to interpret uh, what God has revealed to us. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, we talk about um, two different ways of knowing God. Uh, the first is uh, knowing God through revelation. Sorry, go knowing God through reason. So, you know, that's our natural cognitive abilities, you know, we can look at creation, we can look into our consciences, and from this we can infer that God exists. We can infer from this that, um, you know, he has imbued nature with a moral order, so there are such a things as good and evil. And we can know these things with certainty, actually. Uh, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 50, it says, by natural reason, man can know God with certainty, on the basis of his works. Now, there's a limit to what we can know from natural reason, however. There are many things that you wouldn't know about God if you were just observing the world around you. So God has to make things known about himself. So the rest of this paragraph goes on to say, but there is another order of knowledge which man cannot possibly arrive at by his own powers, the order of divine revelation through an utterly free decision, God has revealed himself and given himself to man. This he does by revealing the mystery, his plan of loving goodness, formed from all eternity in Christ for the benefit of all men. God has fully revealed this plan by sending us his beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about revelation, we cannot separate that from authority because, of course, um, what God reveals uh, carries inherent authority in it, but because what God reveals is subject to interpretation, there also has to be an authoritative interpreter. So the main source of authority, of course, is the Bible, sacred scripture. Um, but uh, unlike Protestants who may hold to sola scriptura, the Bible alone is their infallible authority, Catholics believe that there are other sources of infallible authority besides that. We also believe in what is known as sacred tradition, which are the things which the apostles uh, preached um, orally uh, and has been passed on by the church. And then you have the magisterium of the church, uh, which is the uh, institution itself and its leaders, and they interpret the former two, scripture and tradition. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these three in turn. First, we'll talk about sacred scripture. Um, this is where we talk about the concept of inspiration. We refer to the Bible as inspired. And this comes from a couple of verses. In, first in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it states the following, and I quote, All scripture is breathed out by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then uh, St. Peter in 2 Peter 1.21 explains the same concept in these words. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So whenever a prophet speaks or whenever an inspired writer puts down um, divine revelation in writing, it is the Holy Spirit guiding um, the sacred author so that whatever he intends is what is put down in writing. Connected to this is the topic of inerrancy, which is the idea that if God is the one guiding the sacred author, then it follows that whatever the sacred author writes must be free from error. 
The Second Vatican Council that convened in the 1960s put out a document called De Verbum, which is a summary of the church's teaching on the nature of scripture. In paragraph 11, <clears throat> De Verbum states, I quote, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error, that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation. Now, it is not true, as some might suggest, that this concept of inerrancy only applies to the theological um, parts of the Bible. In fact, uh, the concept of inerrancy applies to the whole of Scripture, and multiple popes have uh, condemned the notion that you can limit uh, the, the scope of inerrancy. For example, Pope Leo XIII, uh, in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus, uh, states the following, but it is absolutely wrong and forbidden either to narrow inspiration to certain parts only of sacred scripture or to admit that the sacred writer has erred. For all the books which the church receives as sacred and canonical are written wholly and entirely with all their parts at the dictation of the Holy Ghost. And so far is it, it from being possible that any error can coexist with inspiration. That inspiration not only is essentially incompatible with error, but excludes and rejects it as absolutely and necessarily as it is impossible that God himself, the supreme truth, can utter that which is not true. So Pope Leo XIII says all of scripture is inerrant. Um, now, we must remember when we're reading the Bible, um, if you're reading it in English, you are reading a translation of the Bible, but it wasn't originally in English. Uh, instead, the Old Testament was originally written in mostly in Hebrew with parts in Aramaic and Greek. And on the top right, you can see a picture of what the Hebrew language looks like in its written form. And then the New Testament, by contrast, was originally written entirely in the Greek language. In the bottom right, you can see an example of what ancient Greek looks like. Um, now, because most of us don't read Hebrew or Greek, uh, it was necessary to translate these into other languages. So today, uh, if you go to a bookstore or on Amazon, you'll see that there are many different translations of the Bible into English. Uh, there's the King James Version, the New International Version, the English Standard Version, etc. Uh, version there just means translation. They're all ultimately trying to uh, translate the original Hebrew and Greek um, in the, into English for our understanding. Now, because of the distance, uh, because of the fact that we are reading the Bible in translation, and because of the fact that um, there is a cultural um, distance between us and the original writings, there is a lot of room for misunderstanding the Bible. Even in the first century, when the, Bi the New Testament was being written, there were already warnings that parts of it were being misinterpreted by people. St. Peter, uh, writing in his second epistle, states the following, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So St. Peter is telling us that scripture is liable to be misinterpreted, and St. Paul's letters especially so. For this, we rely on the other two sources of authority to tell us when scripture is being interpreted rightly. So let me speak to the topic of sacred tradition. So Dei Verbum in paragraph 9 explains this, it this way. Tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that, enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. As a result, the church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. In the Bible itself, we see that tradition is necessary to understand the scripture. Um, St. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, notes the following. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. 
And in the same book, uh, in chapter 3, verse 16, he sa states the following. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. So according to St. Paul, uh, tradition is passed down both by spoken word and by letter. In fact, there are many things that the apostle explained orally uh, that was not explicitly put into writing. If you read the Bible, you'll see many um, ideas that are hinted at but are not explained because the apostle already explained them orally um, in their preaching and did not feel the need to repeat it in writing. Now, besides this, there is also the authority of the church, what we refer to as the magisterium. Uh, again, in De Verbum states the following. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in form tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. The Catechism uh, interprets this statement to mean, I quote, this means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. And once again, scripture uh, speaks to us in this matter. Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19, has uh, Jesus vesting St. Peter with special authority. You are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, a number of New Testament scholars, even Protestant ones, such as W.D. Davies, uh, R.T. France and Craig Keener have recognized that in this passage, Jesus is giving uh, St. Peter special authority um, as distinct from all the apostles. And in the Catholic tradition, we continue to believe that St. Peter's authority uh, rests with his successors, who are the bishops of Rome. And then 1 Timothy 3.15 states that the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of truth. Of course, a pillar's role is to hold something up. Um, the pillar is not above the truth itself, which is why the Catechism says, yet this magisterium is not superior to the word of God, but is its servant. It teaches only what has been handed on to it at the divine command and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it listens to this devotedly, guards it with dedication, and expounds it faithfully. All that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed is drawn from this single deposit of faith. Now, um, I have one more element of my presentation. Um, even though I spoke about three sources of authority, I want to focus in on the Bible, um, from which the other two um, are, you know, means of explanation. Now, the question that always arises when Christians are in dialogue with Muslims is, well, how do we know that whatever the Bible says can be relied upon? Um, now, there are many ways that Christian scholars and apologists have explained the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, there is corroboration from archaeology and non-biblical texts. There is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. There's eyewitness testimony of the apostles. And there's the application of what are known as criteria of authenticity to events in Scripture. Uh, because uh, we have very limited time, and I want uh, to give our you know, esteemed guests, his time to speak as well. I'm only going to focus on the latter two of these. Um, eyewitness testimony is a very important part of the biblical uh, testimony. Um, it assumes that whatever is spoken down did not, uh, whatever's written down was not put into writing hundreds of years later when it would not have been impossible to verify, but it was written by people who were there to witness it. Richard Baucom, uh, in his Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, states in page 7, The Gospels were written within living memory of the events they recount. Mark's Gospel was written well within the lifetime of many of the eyewitnesses, while the other three canonical Gospels were written in the period when living eyewitnesses were becoming scarce, exactly at the point in time when their testimony would perish were not put into writing. Uh, this is a very important book on the topic of eyewitness testimony, by the way. I highly recommend anyone who is interested in, top, in this topic to get a copy of it because he goes into much more detail about what it means for the Gospels to be based on eyewitness testimony. Uh, in the 
in the books itself, we have reference to the topic of eyewitness testimony. For example, Acts chapter 2, verse 32, St. Peter states, This Jesus God raised up, and of this we are all are witnesses. And then St. John, in his first epistle, in the beginning, states, What was from the beginning, which we have heard, which you have seen with our eyes, which you have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So St. John is saying, you know, uh, these are things that we've witnessed ourselves. Uh, St. Peter also um, affirms the same thing in 2 Peter 1, 16 and 18. He states, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And then finally, in the Gospel of John, at the end, it states the following. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written about these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So the Gospel of John proclaims itself to be the eyewitness testimony of the beloved disciple. Now, it's one thing for them to say that they are eyewitness um, um, testimonies. But how do we know they're telling the truth? After all, they could be making stuff up. Now, this is where the idea of criteria of authenticity comes in. And for this, I recommend the book. Who is Jesus? Linking the historical Jesus with the Christ of faith by Daryl Bach. He takes some of these uh, criteria of authenticity and applies them to various stories in the life of Jesus, showing how um, they show that these could not have been merely inventions of the church. Now, I'm going to focus in on three specific criteria. There are a lot more than just three, but um, due to time constraints, I want to focus on what I think are the most important ones to make note of. First, there's the criterion of embarrassment. Uh, this means that the authors of religious documents tend to present their leaders in a positive light and don't invent stories that portray them negatively. There's the criterion of dissimilarity. Sayings and events that are dissimilar to the practice of the early church are unlikely to have been invented because after all, the tr church was in the practice of just making things to bolster her teachings they wouldn't create things that are different in emphasis from what they would teach. Finally, the criterion of multiple attestation. Sayings and events record in multiple traditions indicate that they're likely to be historical. Uh, for the Muslims listening, this is analogous to what you would refer to as tawattr and the uh, topic of hadith transmission. You know, when you have multiple uh, authenticated chains narrating the same event, it is all but certain that it is historically um, true. Now, how do we apply these to the Gospels? Uh, I'll give you a few examples. So with the criterion of embarrassment, you have the fact that the Gospels often present the disciples as incompetent or not understanding their master. If uh, the church was merely inventing these stories, they would present the disciples as superheroes. But the fact that they're shown as flawed human beings means that these are uh, not mere inventions. Also, the fact that Jesus often makes hard sayings that are difficult to understand or easy to misinterpret. Why would the church put words into Jesus' mouth that are that's only going to cause misinterpretation later on? Now, as for the criterion of the similarity, uh, one notable example is the fact that Jesus' preferred title for himself is not Son of God or Christ, uh, as Christians uh, often refer to him in our devotions, but rather the phrase, the Son of Man. And the fact that um, this, this title, which, by the way, comes from the Old Testament in Daniel 7, is his preferred title, rather than uh, the ones that the church often uses in liturgy and prayer, is indication that the Son of Man traditions scattered throughout the Gospels are authentic. Finally, you have the criterion of multiple attestation. There are a number of events that are recorded in all four Gospels, and if you look at them, they're not word for word the same. There's just enough variation in their detail that you can rule out the possibility of uh, collusion um, in trying to get the story straight, and therefore they must be identified as independent sources. This includes such stories as the baptism at the Jordan River, the feeding of the 5,000, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the crucifixion, and as also the resurrection. 
all of these criteria of authenticity uh, are what uh, Christian apologists and scholars uh, use to show that the gospel traditions and New Testament more broadly can be relied upon. Uh, and with that, my presentation is done. I hope that you found this to be uh, illuminating. Yeah, thank you for that, Louis. All right, uh, Farhan, do you have a presentation that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I do have a presentation. Let me see how this works. Okay. Okay, so I'll have to okay upload a file, I guess. Well, you should go to go to the bottom and hit share. Yeah, yeah. share share button, and then select share screen. There we go. We can see it now. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm going to start now. I, you can hear me and everything good? Yes. Okay. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم First of all I would like to uh, thank uh, Lewis for inviting me to this uh, dialogue it's very interesting uh, revelation and authority in Islam and Christianity uh, that's what we're talking about today and it's it's a very interesting a topic of discussion and I hope uh, that we can carry on this conversation and dialogue in the future as well as you mentioned earlier with some other topics as well I, I think it's it's going to be a learning uh, process for us and and our audience uh, hopefully uh, with God's will okay so revelation and authority uh, in Islam, right? I mean, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, you've already heard uh, the side from uh, Lewis, which talks about uh, revelation and authority fr from the Catholic perspective. So when I started thinking about this topic, um, you know, I think the first thing that we need to do is define what is a revelation. Uh, we have in the Holy Quran, chapter 42, verse 52, uh, where God says, Which means, and it is not for a man that Allah should speak to him except by direct revelation or from behind a veil or by sending a messenger to reveal by his command what he pleases. Surely, he is high, wise. So that's chapter 42, verse 52 of the Holy Quran, which, which talks about the three different ways in which God speaks to his uh, chosen servants. Then God says, and thus we reveal to thee the word by our command. Thou didst not know what the book was, nor what the faith, but we have made it, the revelation, a light whereby we guide such of our servants as we please, and truly thou guidest my, mankind to the right path. In another place we have, um, in chapter 16, verse 90, we have uh, the following, and we have sent down to thee the book to explain everything, and a guidance and a mercy and glad tidings to those who submit to Allah. Yet another place in the Holy Quran, it is stated, a messenger from Allah, that is uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, reciting pure scriptures wherein are lasting commandments. So, so what is uh, revelation? What is, uh, you know, uh, how, ca how can we define revelation? In essence, the Quran is the word of God in Islam, the direct revelation of God to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. And we also see it as a perfect code of law. It is the 
you know, and, and our topic is revelation and authority. So ultimate authority in Islam is the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran would be seen as the ultimate authority. Uh, it can be even stated that the Holy Quran is the only source of authority in Islam and all other sources uh, ultimately go back to the Quran. They come from uh, the Holy Quran. And I think most Muslims, uh, whether they are Ahmadi Muslims or not, uh, they would agree with that, that the Holy Quran is the final authority uh, in Islam. Uh, the next uh, aspect of revelation that is important to understand from the Islamic perspective is how does God reveal, right? I already shared a verse uh, of the Holy Quran in the beginning, which mentioned the three ways in, in which God communicates, God speaks to his servants. So number one is by direct revelation. Right, God speaks through direct revelation. Number two is through a dream or a vision. Right, through through a dream or, or, or a vision, something is revealed, something from the unseen, as we call it in Islam, the ghayb, uh, al ghayb, uh, something from the unseen is revealed to uh, the prophet or messenger. And number three, by sending an angel who is carrying a message that is delivered to the uh, to the prophet uh, or messenger um revelation is called wahi or ilham in islam uh, these terms uh, are can, can they are mostly used interchangeably in the in the holy quran and uh, i don't have the i don't have the nice uh, screenshot of the books uh, that i wanted to uh, share with you um, that's a point uh, that I have noted. I, I saw Lewis uh, present some screenshots. That was very nice. Uh, if you want to read more on this, and, and of course, I'm also limited by the time we have today. Um, there's a lot of more, a lot of discussion about revelation, types of revelation in a book by the promised Messiah. And the title is Barahimne Ahmadiyya. And it's available for free download on alislam.org, which is the website of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, which goes into a lot of other details related to revelation. Um, again, the promised Messiah is Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, as I introduced him in the beginning. He is the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Now, moving on, what, what makes the Quran the word of God, right? The in italics. What is what is what makes the Quran as uh, as the ultimate authority, the ultimate word of God? What makes it distinct? What makes it different from other revelations that have come from before the Holy Quran? Somebody could say that there have been other revelations. Why are they not enough? Why do we have to accept the Quran as well? Right. That could be a question, or some other questions could that could be asked. Uh, you know why. Why should the Quran be considered so special? There are a number of things that make the Holy Quran, the revelation of the Holy Quran, distinct from other revelations. And I'll just share five points in this regard with you. Um, not, you know, not to make it too long, I've kept it really brief. Uh, some points about why the Holy Quran is uh, distinct. Um, so the first point is that the Holy Quran is a universal uh, teaching. The Quran has a, a teaching that is applicable to all times, right? And not just not just um, not just a specific period, not just a specific nation. It is a message for all uh, people over all time. The Quran states, for instance, "A'uzu billahi min shaitan rajim, wali kulli qawmin had." For every nation, there has been a guide. That is in chapter 13, verse 8 of the Holy Quran. All other revelations from before the Quran were limited to their nations and their times. We do not believe, uh, and in this case, because we are comparing the Quran, the Bible a little bit, we do not believe that the Bible came for all people all across the world, uh, including Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's primary uh, responsibility was to deliver the message to the Israelites uh, and not to, to the whole world. That's our perspective anyways. And similarly, other revelations were for their specific time. Now, why do I say this? Um, why is there a way to, to, to explain this or to emphasize this? First of all, uh, is this even claimed 
in the Holy Quran. And I have a couple of uh, verses that you can see here uh, from chapter 7, verse 159, where God says, Qul ya ayyuhan nasu inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. Say, O mankind, truly I am a messenger to you all. So uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a messenger for all people and not just uh, any one uh, specific uh, nation. He was a messenger for all people. Similarly, another verse, which is chapter 34, verse 29, which says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرًا النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Which means, and we have not sent thee, but as a bearer of glad tidings and a warner for all mankind. كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ all mankind, but most men know not. So this is the claim. This is the very clear uh, statement uh, in the Quran that this is a message for all people. Um, and it does not differentiate between, uh, you know, any particular uh, nation. Now, when it comes to universality, um, one other example that I, want, uh, that I wanted to give, uh, just to illustrate this a little more, uh, is... Uh, the Islamic concept of justice. So we have in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21, it says, show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So very strong teaching of, uh, you can say, punishment or vengeance, that uh, any kind of harm that is done to you respond to it with the same kind of harm punish uh, to, you know to the same extent in the to the same amount um, so this was a teaching that was given to the israelites and it it had a purpose uh, the israelites were in bondage they were slaves for centuries and to bring them out of that it was necessary to uh, to have this kind of strong uh, teaching of punishment so that they could come out of it and become free people again so th there's a context behind this uh, when we compare this to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 40, it says, you have heard, that is Jesus saying, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give your coat, give your coat as well. So, so this is a very different teaching we have, uh, you know, on your screen here, you have the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, uh, you know, and you can contrast the two teachings that are very different. One is one extreme. The, the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible is on, on one end of the spectrum and the New Testament is on the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, forgiveness. The focus is on forgiveness. Um, and there's a context behind that, too. And that's that's another de debate. But I just wanted to show you the, the, the contrast with these two teachings. Now, compare that to the Holy Quran, which says in chapter 42, verse 41, which means, remember that the recompense, recompense of an injury is an injury the like thereof, but whoso forgives and thereby brings about a reformation, his reward is with Allah. Surely Allah loves not the wrongdoers. So we hear, we have here a universal teaching that that goes along the middle path. Neither one extreme of punish every time nor the other extreme of forgive every time. We have a central universal teaching that uh, yes, uh, for the sake of justice, the punishment should be equal to the crime that has been committed. But if you find that there is a there is there is some some chance that if you forgive the other person the the, the criminal and you know and he he reforms uh, himself or herself then that would be the better way to go right so we have a balanced teaching and, and a universal teaching in the holy quran uh, in this regard i have a quotation uh, and and uh, I've already talked about this enough, so I'll just end this part of my presentation, uh, you know, regarding distinction number one, uh, with this quotation. Uh, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmed, 
Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he was the fourth head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He writes, and this is in his book, Some Distinctive Features of Islam. You can again find this on alislam.org. He writes, Islam thus combines the best features of both the earlier teachings with the vital addition that forgiveness is commended, provided it is, it is likely to result in an improvement and in the correction of the defaulter, that being the real objective. If not, then punishment is held to be necessary, but not exceeding the degree to which one is wrong. Surely this guidance is in full conformity with human nature and is as practicable today as when it was revealed 14 centuries ago. So that's distinction number one. Distinction number two with the Holy Quran uh, is, the, is, the, is the distinction it has in terms of its perfect preservation. Uh, there is a verse of the Holy Quran in chapter 15, verse 10, which says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Verily, we ourselves have sent down this exhortation, and most surely we will be its guardian. This is what God says. So um, this means that this is this is this is this is a prophecy. This is a this is a statement of the Quran, which uh, shows that the Quran is preserved. No other book in the history of humankind has enjoyed the kind of preservation that the Quran has enjoyed. When we look at uh, the historical evidence, when we look at uh, the way the Quran was compiled, when we look at the way the Quran was memorized, uh, we, we come to this, we can, you know, this is the only conclusion we are going to come up with. Uh, there are many ways in which the Holy Quran was preserved, perfectly preserved. Uh, but I'll just mention a couple of points here. One is that the Holy Quran was both written down and memorized during the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings of God be upon him. We have a plethora of narrations from the history of Islam that prove to us that during the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the entire Quran had been written down on multiple uh, manuscripts or, uh, you know, they had tree barks or papyrus or other things that they were writing on. So it was entirely written down and it was entirely memorized by hundreds of uh, of of companions and and by the time the prophet muhammad peace be upon him died uh, there were a hundred thousand companions right according to according to narrations but let's say only ten thousand of those one hundred thousand companions had memorized the quran and each one of them taught the quran to the next generation just to 50 each one of them if they taught it uh, taught the holy quran or uh, in, in its entirety just to just to just 50 uh students you, you know, you would have half a million, uh, you know, huffaz, uh, those who had memorized the Holy Quran within the first generation of Islam. So we have this uh, aspect of the, of the of the protection of the Holy Quran, and of course, it was recited in the in the five daily prayers, and it was discussed, and it was recited in its entirety every year uh, during the month of uh, Ramadan, and so on and so forth. And then, secondly. We have the entire Holy Quran available to us from first century extant manuscripts. What is extant manuscripts? This refers to those manuscripts that were that are that we have today from the first century of, of Islam, that is before 699 CE. We have the Holy Quran almost entirely. Uh, 96, 97 percent of the Holy Quran is available to us from those manuscripts that are from the first century. Now, uh, again, slight comparison here from the first century of Christianity. We have no extant manuscripts of the New Testament. Uh, we have manuscripts that come after the first century. But from the first century in itself, we don't have any such um, uh, manuscripts. So the the the, the pr preservation of the Holy Quran is 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 a well established fact. Um, we have opponents of uh, Islam. Uh, those those people who have written critically of Islam who have accepted this. Uh, for instance, I have a I have a couple of quotations here of Sir William Muir, who has written the book Life of Muhammad, in which he writes, "We may, upon the strongest presumption, affirm." that every verse is the genuine and unaltered composition of Muhammad himself. And he also says, there is otherwise every security internal and external that we possess the text 
which Muhammad himself gave forth and used. Now I have, uh, I am taking a bit too much time here, so I'm going to uh, skim through the rest of uh, my presentation because I don't want to take up too much of my time here. So we have uh, the third distinction, um, and there are many distinctions. I've just selected a few, and even in those few, I'm, on, I'm only discussing some basics here. The third distinct distinction we have of the Holy Quran, it's the fact that it is matchless. We have a challenge in the Holy Quran in chapter 2, verse 24, which it says, if you are in doubt as to what we have sent down to, to our servant, then produce a chapter like it and call upon your helpers beside Allah if you are truthful. So this is a challenge of the Holy Quran. There are there are other uh, challenges in the Holy Quran that uh, that are mentioned in chapter two verse uh, sorry chapter ten verse thirty nine, chapter eleven verse fourteen, chapter seventeen verse eighty nine, and chapter fifty two verses thirty four and thirty five, uh, where uh, you know it, it gives a challenge that if you if you think that this is not from God, produce something like it. Uh, this means produce something that has the internal and external qualities of the Holy Quran. The internal qualities are its ability to reform a person, its guidance, its message, its teachings. I give you an example of a teaching, uh, you know, in, when I was talking about distinction number one. And it also uh, has external qualities, the beauty of its writing, the uh, the brevity with which it writes, with which everything is written um, and, and conveyed, the clarity, the eloquence, and all those things uh, included uh, makes up the internal and external qualities of the Holy Quran that it is challenging its opponents to reproduce. Distinction number four uh, in the Holy Quran is the, the regarding the revelation of the Holy Quran is that the revelation of the Quran itself, of course, that has come to an end. Uh, the, the, the faith is perfect. Um, but the those who follow the Quran sincerely can reach a point where they are so close to God that God speaks to them. Uh, the, the, there's a verse of the Holy Quran, chapter 14, verses 25 to 26 says, Does thou not see how Allah sets forth a parable of a good word? It is like a good tree whose root is firm and whose branches reach into heaven. It brings forth its fruit at all times by the command of its Lord. In other words, those who follow the Quran with a humble spirit and devotion, God may exalt their status uh, to the point that they become recipients of revelation. There's a quotation of the promised Messiah. I have two quotations, but to save some time, I'll just present one. Uh, again, uh, the promised Messiah, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Azad Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, he writes, A true relationship with God the Exalted can never develop unless that relationship is created exclusively through the instrumentation of God. Carnal temptations cannot be removed from the soul until a light from the omnipotent God enters the heart. Behold, I present first-hand testimony that such a relationship can only be possible through following the Holy Quran. The other scriptures are now devoid of the spirit of life. There is now only one book under the canopy of the heavens that reveals the countenance of the of that true beloved, that is the Holy Quran. This is in the book Hakikatul Wahi. You can you can consult it um, again on uh, find it on alislam.org. Distinction number five, the last distinction that I wanted to discuss are the unique prophecies of uh, uh, the unique prophecies of uh, the, the the holy quran uh, you know and 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 there are many many uh, unique and extraordinary prophecies of the holy quran and uh, you know again for the sake of brevity i've just selected one example uh, for today's dialogue it, it is found in chapter 10 verses 91 to 93 it says and we brought the children of Israel across the sea and Pharaoh and his hosts pursued them wrongfully and aggressively till when the calamity of drowning overtook him, he said. Now, this is in the context of, you know, Pharaoh and his army pursuing uh, the children of Israel, Moses and, 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 the, and his followers uh, across the sea. And, uh, you know, as you know, that uh, the, the, the water levels rose and uh, he he uh, drowned or almost drowned uh, in the waters. At the time when he was drowning, the Quran claims that he said, Amantu annahu la ilaha illa ladhi amanat bihi banu isra'ila wa ana min al-muslimin. I believe that there is no God but he in whom the children of Israel believe and I am of those who submit to him. God said in response, what now? 
while thou wast disobedient before this and wast of those who create disorder, so this day we will save thee in thy body alone that thou mayest be a sign to those who come after thee and surely many of mankind are heedless of our signs. This is important. The Quran is the only book that I know of and if you know of any other book, please let me know. The Quran is the only book that I know of that says that Pharaoh had this conversation with God while he was drowning. Nobody could have reported this. Nobody could have really heard this because everybody was drowning. They were trying to, they were trying to save their lives. And at those moments he said this, and God says, this day we will save thee and thy body alone. So that is a clear reference to him being saved from drowning and mummified, right? Because his body was to be saved, preserved. So this announcement from the Holy Quran is something that, I, I, as far as I know, there's no there's no human source of history which talks about this, which refers to this last piece of dialogue between Pharaoh and God Almighty. And there's no human source of history that has ever referred to the saving of Pharaoh's body for the purpose of it becoming a source of guidance. And again, if if there is a source out there, I would I would I would be interested. Uh, when the Quran was being revealed, the Arabs had no idea what mummification is. They had no idea that the pharaohs were buried underground and they would be discovered, uh, you know, 14, 15 centuries later. Um, they couldn't have come up with this. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not have known this. So the Quran has clearly made a claim or a statement that was fulfilled in this day and age because we have Ramesses II who was discovered. Uh, in the late 19th century, uh, which is believed to be the same pharaoh who was uh, there at the time of Moses. So this is an interesting, uh, interesting prophecy of the Holy Quran. This is one, just one example I'm sharing with you today. Um, last couple of slides I have here is that in terms of authority, going back to the beginning, we have in the in Islam, the Holy Quran, we have the Sunnah, the practice, the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we also have the Hadith, the statements of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we believe the Messiah, according to the traditions, was going to be Hakam and Adal. He was going to be the judge and the arbiter of the latter days. So we see authority in him as well to uh, uh, to, to uh, make uh, decisions on faith matters and, and convey them to us. So we have that authority. And lastly, I have this quotation again that I will end the presentation with uh, is again by the promised Messiah, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He states, I swear by him that just as he granted his converse to the prophets, I'm sorry about the uh, uh, typos here, uh, the prophet Abraham and then to Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Joseph, Moses and Jesus, uh, son of Mary. Salam, peace and blessings of God be upon all of them. And after them all spoke with unmatched clarity and purity to our Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him. So did he honor me with his converse and revelation. But this honor was bestowed upon me solely because of my complete submission to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. This is in the book, Divine Manifestations, that you can consult again on alislam.org. Thank you. All right. And so now we're going to just kind of have a um, back and forth between the two of you where you can ask each other questions and further dialogue and interact with each other's presentations. Um, Farhan, did you want to start by asking Lewis any questions that you may have about his presentation? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can start. Um, so, so Lewis, uh, you mentioned that the Bible is the authoritative uh, text uh, or inerrant i think you were arguing mm -hmm. uh, for the inerrancy yes. of the of the bible uh, how do you decide when it comes to the gospels which one has uh, authority or which one has the final uh, statement when it comes to contradiction so for instance in the gospel of matthew chapter 28 jesus goes to galilee after his resurrection and then goes to heaven but in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, he stays in Jerusalem. He never goes to Galilee. And then he goes to heaven from Jerusalem. 
So when you have this kind of uh, difference, how do you how do you reconcile? Yeah. So as a matter of principle, I don't believe that and there are any true contradictions in the Gospels. So there are only apparent contradictions, which if you read more closely, there are actually plausible ways of harmonizing them. So um, with the example that you gave, um, Luke's Gospel actually uh, has a... Um, it has a, he uses a method known as telescoping where a number of events that are that take place over an extended period of time are actually apparently compressed into a single um, day um, but it's not you know those who are reading on like for example if you read on in acts um, Luke makes clear that uh, these things actually did take place over an extended period of time um, so by the time he's saying uh, remain in Jerusalem, um, that's not, you know, the, the disciples had already gone back there after being in Galilee for a while. Um, actually, uh, a good book uh, that I would recommend if you're interested in this is Craig Blomberg's The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, where he goes into a lot of these apparent contradictions um, and shows how if you apply uh, some of these uh, hermeneutical methods, the contradictions do actually disappear. Okay. Okay. You can uh, ask a question if you like. Okay. So, um, so I, I'm curious because, um, you know, you, you talked about the Quran being the ultimate authority for Muslims, but, you know, as um, is well known, uh, Muslims tend to disagree over its interpretation, which is why we have different communities such as the Ahmadiyya. Uh, the various Sunni madhabs, you know, the different forms of Shiism, etc. Even the Quran itself says some of its ayat are muhkam or clear, whereas others are mutashabbiha, which is unclear. So how does one determine which ayat are muhkam, which ones are mutashabbiha, and then who gets to interpret the mutashabihat? Right. Uh, mutashabihat uh, doesn't mean that they are unclear. Uh, it means, and the same verse that you have quoted this from, says that the mutashabihat are verses that are open to multiple interpretations. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, they are unclear. It just means that they have multiple meanings uh, that you can drive out of them. The muhkamat are the firm and absolute in meaning and have limited, uh, you know, leeway in terms of in terms of interpretation. So when when it comes to the Holy Quran, we look at the muhkamat. We look at the uh, at the absolute uh, firm in meaning uh, verses, and we use uh, those to uh, understand the commentary of the mutashabihat. Um, we have, uh, for instance, a, a concept in the Islamic science of tafsir, which is tafsir of the Holy Quran by the Holy Quran. So in other words, if if the, the commentary of uh, one verse uh, is made in such a way that it contradicts other verses of the Holy Quran, that would not be accepted because the Holy the, the commentary has to be has to be uh, uniform and it has to be supported. So each verse has to be supported by uh, other uh, other verses. Uh, the meanings of each verse have to be supported by other verses. And this kind of science is applied to Ahadith as well, but that's another another uh, subject. Now, when when it comes to you know you know stepping back a little bit, when it comes to uh, the uh, the you know you have asked about multiple interpretations, that is always the case with with the written word. And uh, when it comes to the Bible, there are multiple interpretations. When it comes to other books that are believed to be books from God, there are multiple interpretations. And that's why we have sects within Christianity and within is Islam. Um, but you know, we have to uh, look at the evidence before we we make any conclusions, right? Uh, you know, I belong to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. A lot of uh, judgments are made regarding my faith without even uh, asking me or without even knowing anything about me and and uh, or about Ahmadis. And so that's why you know a lot of a lot of times it's just uh, people are getting emotional over these things. I think if you are uh, if you are cool-headed and if you consult the evidence, uh, it's pretty clear which verse means what, uh, which ones are muhkamad, which ones are mutashabihat. It becomes pretty clear. All right. Thank you for that. All right. So can I ask another question then? Go right ahead. Yeah. So um, in terms of 
the authority um you know you you've mentioned three sources uh, mm. of authority in the catholic uh, church so when it comes to the doctrine of the trinity which is pretty fundamental to christian uh, beliefs and i'm most christians believe in the trinity except maybe the unitarians or or a couple of other sects um so so where where does the authority regarding this doctrine the trinity itself yeah. come from is it in the bible or is it some other source yeah so if you look at the debates that occurred in the fourth and fifth centuries over the doctrine of the trinity uh you'll notice that the early church fathers always back went back to sacred scripture uh saint athanasius would quote from the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, showing how um, these verses uh, prove the divinity of Jesus Christ. And then St. Basil the Great uh, wrote a whole treatise on the Holy Spirit, showing that the divinity of the Holy Spirit um, is uh, derived from sacred scripture itself. And this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about how the church uh, functions as the um, authoritative interpreter of scripture. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that all the specifics of Trinitarian doctrine are explicitly mentioned in sacred scripture. So you know how in Nicaea and Constantinople, we started using um, language such as um, homoousios or you know the three hypostases of the Trinity. Um, now, obviously the Bible doesn't talk about um, um, god in that way instead what we have is what is known as a development of doctrine um, and, and in catholicism we have a very um developed idea of uh, development of doctrine thanks to um such great theologians as saint john henry newman uh, uh saint newman actually um came up with this little analogy you know the truths that are contained in scripture are like a little acorn um all the essentials are there uh, but in a latent form. And then over time, um, it gets developed. It gets developed as a result of controversies where people start asking questions. Uh, and this forces the church to clarify uh, what she means when she uh, uh, speaks of things like, you know, Christ being divine or of the Holy Spirit being uh, a person of God. So you see how the three sources of authority work here where scripture is primary but uh, tradition in the church helped to draw out um explicitly what is latent in scripture right so so what what is the source of uh what is the authority on the trinity like who, who decided was it the church um, it's the church uh meditating on scripture so uh, it's never the church arbitrarily deciding things, but it's the church looking through uh, what ha she has received and interpreting them. Okay, so the church is another source of authority. Yes. Okay. Okay. And 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 because we have some time, I see that. Okay, so going back to the previous question uh, regarding the mm -hmm. resurrection of Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. Just prior to the resurrection, was he in Galilee or Jerusalem? Because when I look at Luke chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 28, mm -hmm. I find no space for Jesus to have been in both places at the same time. Yeah. So he, here's how, you know, I would, you know, there are a couple of different proposals for how to understand um, these texts. Uh, and here it, it helps to like maybe... Um, include uh, St. John's um, uh, gospel in the picture. So you'll notice how in John, the entire 20th chapter takes place in um, Judea, in Jerusalem. Uh, so all four gospels are unanimous that the initial, um, the initial um, resurrection appearances took place there. And then in the 21st chapter, it talks about the fact that um, that Jesus was actually in the Sea of Galilee along with the disciples. And then you'll notice uh, in the Gospel of Luke that there is another experience. You know, you know, you remember the Emmaus Road uh, experience that St. Luke records. And after that, um, he refers to Jesus appearing again to disciples in Jerusalem. Now, St. Luke doesn't mention this explicitly, but this is where the telescoping comes in. 
this doesn't necessarily all take place, um, you know, all at once, but it's spread out over a longer period of time. So there's um, enough time for the, Gal the Galilee appearance to have appeared, to have taken place just before Jesus gives the um, order to remain within Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit arrives. Okay. Um, if you like, I would actually do have um, some questions as well. So, um, you know, this one is more of an Ahmadi specific question. So, you know, um, one of the things that we have in common is we have um, somewhat of a centralized authority figure in Catholicism. We have Pope in the Ahmadi community. You have the Khalifa Tul Masih. Um, and uh, who is the, you know, the sort of like the successor of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Uh, I, I'm curious to know more about his role in interpreting the Quran and the Sunnah in the Ahmadi community. So can he make infallible statements similar to what Catholics believe about the Pope? And if so, how do you determine which of his statements count as infallible? Uh, or maybe none of them are infallible and you know it's possible that he could err in the things he says. So uh, when it comes to his, uh, uh, you know, infallibility is is first of all a subject that uh, it, it I, I guess it started being discussed with Catholicism because there were some uh, popes who made certain dictates that were changed later on. Um, in, in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we haven't encountered any such uh, occasion. Now. Mm -hmm. Is he is the is the Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community? Uh, is he is he human? Yes, he is human, um, and uh, there are positions that he might take that he might uh, change later on, and that we have seen uh, in in our history. We have had five uh, caliphs of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and um, they have they have uh, you know at one point or another. Uh, changed position, so it's it matters. It's a matter of academics. It's a matter of theology. That when things are studied, as humans, we are you know what uh, what you as Lewis may have believed five years ago is probably not the same as you believe today. What I believed five ten years ago is definitely not the same as what I believe today because I have maybe studied a little more, maybe contemplated on things a little more. Um, so to that extent, yes. I mean, as time passes. Uh, you you look into things more, you study them more, but nevertheless, as far as our administration of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community goes, he has mm -hmm. the final authority and the final decision making. As far as theological and academic matters go, uh, you know, it, over time, if something needs to be clarified further, it it can be it can be yeah. clarified or discussed for, further. But I, I'm curious about this question because it's a bit uh, yeah. off topic. As far as I'm uh, I mean, it is uh, related because it's a question of authority, right? Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Um, even though it's not explicitly mentioned, the fact that, you know, uh, you belong to a community with a person at the top means that person has a very strong say on matters of faith and morals. Um, uh, now, um, okay, I'll, the rest of my, the quiz, uh, questions that uh, I have are specific to the Quran. Uh, actually, do you have any further questions for me? Um, what, one more question that I wanted to uh, run by you is the uh, Catholic uh, Catholics tend to uh, allow the worship of, or at least praying to the mother of, of Jesus, that is Mary. Um, did we have Jesus ever do that or how does this come come about when it comes to the um, yeah uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that um, this is a question that catholics have all the time uh face all the time with uh, other christian groups such as protestants um so basically we don't worship um the mary or the saints at least not you know in the sense that you know we put them on a pedestal equal to god uh, we, we prefer to use the term veneration, uh, or in uh, Greek and Latin, there are these two terms, latria and dulia. Uh, latria uh, refers to like um, cultic or sacrificial worship, and we believe that is offered to God alone. Uh, dulia is more like 
uh, service or um, honor, and that is given to other religious figures such as Mary and the saints. Um, now, it is implicit in uh, scripture as well. For example, in Mary's Magnificat uh, in, in Luke, she says, all nations will call me blessed. Um, in the Gospel of John at the wedding at Cana, um, you know, now there is this story where um, Mary uh, intercedes uh, on behalf of the people by asking her son to perform a miracle. Um, and um, Jesus does eventually do it, but she says, you know, but he says first, my time has not yet come. And then she responds to this by telling the other people there, do whatever he says. So there's this idea that um, Mary is our intercessor. Um, she presents, she prays for us um, on behalf, of, you know, before God. Uh, because none of these, uh, neither Mary nor the saints, they're, they're, you know, they don't do anything uh, by themselves, but they do things by the power of God and by interceding on behalf of us to God. And finally, you have Revelation chapter 12, uh, which talks about uh, this great woman who uh, delivers the Messiah. Um, and she's presented as a very exalted figure in that passage. So even in the Bible, you already see uh, that there is a high view of Mary that is, again, it's latent there. It's not presented in great detail, uh, but Christians over the centuries have looked at them and they have um, uh, plumbed their depths. Uh, actually, if you like, I can. I, I love. Uh, I'm, I'm making a lot of book suggestions. I realize, but uh, Scott Hahn has a great one called "Hail Holy Queen," subtitle "The Mother of God in the Word of God," where he elaborates how these teachings are derived from the Bible. Now, um, if you like, I do have uh, a few questions, and they are uh, relevant to the question of you know the what you've said about the Quran. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I, I, you know, you talked about the preservation of the Quran, um, how it has been perfectly preserved. Uh, I'm wondering how te Quranic textual criticism factors into that point, because we've had Quranic textual critics such as Marijn Van Putin in this um, show before who discussed variants in the Quran. Uh, and more specifically, I, I want to know, uh, does, uh, how does, uh, perfect preservation, in your view, um, apply to alternate readings found in, say, the companion codices of Ibn Mas'ud and Ubay bin Kab, uh, as well as in the Sana'a palimpsest, uh, which has readings that are different from the Uthmanic recension. Okay, so that's not one question, that is 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, when it comes to when it comes to pre perfect preservation, you have to understand the history first of all, and this is something that you know we could ha have an entire separate uh, separate show discussing mm -hmm. the preservation of the Quran and the preservation of the Bible and, and a comparison. Um, but but a really fast and brief version is that the Quran was written in its entirety during the time mm -hmm. of Prophet Muhammad, and it was. Uh, you know, there was a there was a person named Zad bin Sabit who was made in charge right after his death to to put it all together into a single bound copy. So even though the Quran had been you know written down and memorized, it wasn't in in a in a hard bound book like this. It was um, it was you know in different places with different companions. But uh, during the time of Abu Bakr. It was put together in one book form. And then in the time of Azad Usman, uh, may God be pleased with him, uh, there was a question about these variant readings, as you have called them. These variant readings come from, uh, from the Prophet Muhammad himself. And they're known as Ahruf, right? Ahruf, and the Prophet himself talked about these. Um, and, you know, that's another long discussion. I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible, is that... Uh, what happened is that in 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 Arabia, uh, just as we have today with the English language, where you know we have different accents and different ways of pronouncing uh, certain words, and you know if you go into uh, if you go to Australia, if you go to Scotland, they would have different ways of saying certain things. They would have you know different words in some cases for certain expressions. 
So in Arabia, the same was going on with the different tribes uh, around Medina, around Mecca, having different dialects of Arabic. So the Quran was revealed in these other dialects as well that are known as Ahruf, and there are seven of them. But the main uh, dialect is the, the Hijazi, the Qureshi dialect was the main dialect, and that was the dialect of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. So uh, when, during the time of Usman, uh, there was no longer a need for any other dialect of the Holy Quran to be used. So he standardized the Quran to the original Hijazi Qureshi dialect. And that's where the standardization process happens. And when you, when you talk about these companion codices uh, and their variant readings, most of them, I'm not saying all, but most of them are explained through the differences in dialects or ahruf or kira'at. Now, um, when it comes to the uh, codex of uh, Ibn Masood or the codex of uh, Ubay bin Kaab um, and uh, some questions about, uh, I believe there's a question about the last two chapters of the Holy Quran being part of the Holy Quran or not, or Ubay bin Kaab saying that, uh, you know, ha having an additional two chapters, those two chapters are basically, if you look at those two chapters that are that are attributed to Ubay bin Kaab, they are basically uh, just two, two statements, two verses really, and not two surahs or chapters, which were, uh, which is basically dua qanut, which we recite every day in our Isha prayer as Muslims. So he believed that this might have been part of the Quran, but at the time of Hadith Usman, all these opinions were considered and it was established through mass transmission through the 99.99% of the Sahaba and companions, all saying that this is what the Quran is and this is part of the Quran. It was uh, basically established that this is the Quran that needs to be standardized. And those few opinions here and there, about one or two lines here and there, were uh, deemed to be minority positions, right? And as far as Ibn Masood is concerned or Ibn bin Kaab is concerned, neither of them said, we uh, challenge the standardization of the Quran and here's our manuscript and we should study this manuscript and not the manuscript of Usman. Uh, there's no evidence in history uh, that they actually went to that extent to challenge and to uh, to uh, state that this is the standard, this is what the Quran should be. There is a quite a big possibility that they uh, retracted their opinions or their positions after the standardization of the Quran and it was well established by the uh, vast, vast, vast majority of Sahaba, of companions, that this is the official uh, standard Quran that we should use and we should recite. Again, this is a very brief version of a very big topic that we could explore uh, moving on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do have one more question, but I just want to know first if you had any for me. Uh, I will also ask you this as the last question. Uh, uh -huh. and, and so going back to the differences in the Gospels, when it mm -hmm. comes to the last words of Jesus, um, each of the Gospels says something else. So how do you reconcile mm -hmm. Uh, in, it's funny you should mention that. We have a tradition known as the seven last words. Um, so we actually believe Jesus said all of it. Um, and there is a general accepted uh, idea of what order they were said in. Uh, I know that I believe the last one is generally believed that the last one he did say was, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, but if you just look up the seven last words, um, there is like a you know a harmonization of the exact order that he said all of them in. So um, we don't necessarily believe that there is a contradiction of what Jesus' last words were. Wouldn't th that be saying something new that is different? Like if if you're mm -hmm. not following each of the gospels, then you're almost mm -hmm. creating a fifth gospel that says all of these are last words. Yeah, well, not necessarily because you have to remember that um, some of the gospel writers writing later are aware of uh, the ones that came earlier. For example, the general consensus is the gospel of John was written last. And John 
deliberately omits the vast majority of the stuff that you'll see in the synoptic gospels uh, and that's because you know by the time john's writing these synoptic gospels they've already circulated um and the communities he's writing to are aware of them so his intention is not to uh not to like you know um write another account of the same thing but to uh present certain stories that were not necessarily uh, included in the synoptic gospels uh, which is why you'll see stories in john that are unique to him and you will not find in the synoptics all right so i think we're going to do yeah. some chat questions here could I ask one more question and then we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and just, is this a quick one? Uh, with regards to the inimitability of the Quran, can you point me to like a specific element or feature in the text that demonstrates that the Quran is inimitable? Again, a very quick answer to this because we mm -hmm. are heading towards the end and we would like to take some audience questions as well. Okay. A very quick uh, response to this. Uh, is that if you take the first uh, chapter of the Holy Quran, which is Surah Al-Fatiha, and uh, produce a like of Surah Fatiha that uh, has the same external and internal beauties as Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, that would be considered as trying to meet the challenge, right? Um, so Surah Al-Fatiha is short, it's to the point, it's comprehensive. Those are its external qualities. It's beautiful. It's... Uh, it's written in a, in a way that conveys a lot of meaning, uh, and it's even considered the summary of the Holy Quran. And it's uh, it's um, it has all these external qualities of delivering a lot of uh, teaching and a lot of uh, knowledge about God, about God's relationship with human beings, all of that. Um, and, and and you know, so it has all these external qualities. And then it has it has internal qualities. It's it has the ability to change a person, to reform a person. It has a beautiful prayer. It is a it is a prayer that is all encompassing. That is not limited to any one need or another. It's a, it's a perfect prayer that any, anyone could ask for. Uh, it has uh, reformed others. So these are external and internal qualities. If you could produce something like Surah Al Fatiha, the seven verses. Um, that would be an attempt to change to to uh, to respond to the challenge. All right. So, <clears throat> one of the questions here is: um, Let's see, Iqbal, how do you explain the fact that the Quran confirms narratives recognized as spurious or legendary, like clay birds and things of that sort? Um. You know, when it comes to those kinds of uh, discussions in the Quran, I, I find there's a lot of metaphor in the Quran, as Lewis also pointed out, that there are muhkamat and mutashabihat, right? There are there are verses that are open to multiple interpretations, and there are uh, verses that are fundamental in meaning. So if the Quran says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, that's, uh, you know, one of the muhkamat that is very well established clear fundamental verse about the uh, the fact that God is the provider sustainer of the entire universe um, but when it comes to these uh, re references to Zulkarnan or references to Gog and Magog or references to historical events or references to clay birds in many of these cases these are metaphors that the Quran uses to ex explain something deeper right and we would have to look at each of these cases separately to, to know uh, what they are specifically re referring to. But, uh, you know, if you go into the commentaries, they have discussions, for instance, Zulkarnan uh, was most likely a historical figure uh, who was uh, basically Cyrus of uh, Persia at the time of the exile of the Jews uh, who brought the Jews back. He, he allowed the Jews to go back to their homeland and, and you know, the second temple Judaism began after when they uh, had the temple rebuilt. So it's, uh, it, you know, you have to look at the verses, you have to look at the explanation, you have to look at the context. Uh, in some cases, these are metaphors, just like Jesus used parables to explain certain things. The Quran does some things similar. Uh, Lewis, how does the New Testament transmission of, well, the New mm -hmm. Testament textual transmission compare to the Quran's transmission? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I'm going to focus more on the New Testament side of that. Um, so 
switched off. I put I pulled out a book from my library. It's uh, Nestle Island Greek English New Testament. And uh, one of the things you might notice if you pick up a Greek New Testament is it comes with a little something at the bottom called a critical apparatus, which is basically a listing of variant readings and the manuscripts uh, they are contained in. And the role of this is to alert the reader to the uh, um, variant readings as they uh, occur. So there's a whole um, discipline of New Testament textual criticism that seeks to uh, go through all of these readings and to, um, to determine what is the original in any given circumstances. Uh, now, there are places where uh, there is debate over what the original reading might be. Um, however, there is also this idea that you could, in principle, uh, determine the original reading of every verse in the New Testament based on the extant manuscripts. So uh, one of them can, uh, even if uh, people might have those debates, uh, we can have uh, we can have certainty that all of the readings have been preserved in one manuscript or another. Um, as for the um, Quran's uh, t chronic textual criticism. Uh, as a discipline, chronic textual criticism is uh, still a fairly new discipline. So anything that I say on that topic would have to be tentative and subject to change. But I think I could grant that the um, uh, Othmanic uh, recension is pretty stable, uh, even if there are variants uh, in its Qira'at. Uh, but I do think that if the Son of Palimpsest is any indication, uh, there are readings outside of it, and it would be uh, very interesting to see what other variants of the Quran uh, we might uncover um, in the future. Because as anyone who's looked into the Son of Palimpsest knows, um, a lot of it differs from the Uthmanic recension, not just uh, not just in like, um, you know, not just a diacritic here or there, but actual entire words and phrases are different. <clears throat> Farhan, thank you for your presentation. What gospel does uh, Surah 547 refer to when it advises Christians to judge by the gospel? That's a good question. Um, so the Quran does refer to Injil. The Quran refers to uh, the Injil. The Quran says, Fiha hudan wa nur which means in it is uh, light and guidance. The Quran does refer to the Torah as well and says the same thing about the Torah. Uh, what is the Quran referring to if you uh, don't accept the Bible? Well, uh, this is a misconception about Muslims. We do not consider the Bible to be entirely uh, wrong uh, or corrupted. Uh, we believe the Bible to have corruption in it but as the Quran stated, as the Quran I just quoted from, it, it says that there is light and guidance in there. Um, and so if, uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to the Gospels, I don't find Jesus Christ ever referring to a trinity. I do not find Jesus ever referring to the worship or praying to Mary, his mother. Uh, I don't fi I find Jesus to be praying to the one God uh, that is very much similar to what the Quran states. I find uh, Jesus to be, uh, you know, crying in worship, bowing in worship, which is very similar to the Islamic form of worship. Um, and, and, and so I find him to be a very human prophet of God. He even refers to himself as a prophet at one point. Uh, I find him, for instance, in Mark chapter 12, 12, verses 28 to 30, when someone asks him about the first commandment, he says, Hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord our God is one. Uh, so he refers to God as one. He doesn't equ equate himself to God. There are lots of terminologies that are used in, in Christianity, as Lewis was talk talking about multiple uh, sources of authority. But if you go to the Gospels themselves, uh, they, they're not presenting, at least the synoptic Gospels, they're not presenting Jesus as uh, as, as equal or co-equal with God. And similarly, we have, even in the Gospel of John, 
uh, there are problems with the, the belief that it is uh, with the idea that it is pre presenting Jesus as God. Because if you go to John chapter 10, verses 31 to 40, that ha entire episode with Jews coming to Jesus and accusing him of blaspheming and claiming to be God. And Jesus is su surprised. And he says that you are also called gods in your scripture. So, so what's the big deal if I am referred to as a son of God? So he's referring to the idiom or metaphor in the Bible. So if you study these things, you come to understand that Jesus was only a human being and not God himself. Thank you, gentlemen, for both coming on. I know that we're out of time here. I really appreciate both of your presentations, the interaction, and also answering the chat questions. Uh, Farhan, uh, how can people get in touch with you if they have any questions? Well, they can find me on Twitter at Farhan Iqbal one That is my uh, Twitter, and I have kept my uh, DMs open. Uh, so you can reach out to me there. I have a YouTube channel. It's a very small channel, can channel compared to yours. Uh, it's called Understanding Islam, uh, where I talk about these kind of topics. And I would love to hear feedback and even criticisms of how, how I answered today. And I would appreciate that. And I also appreciate that you have invited me for this dialogue. Uh, it was very interesting and very informative for me. Yeah, glad to do it. And, and Lewis, um, how can people get in touch with you if they have any questions? Um, well, uh you have me on if you can find me on twitter it's at lewis dizon l-e-y-s-d-i-z-o-n um i'm also on facebook and you can dm me uh on both of those social media platforms um if you have any questions or comments about anything i've said excellent gentlemen thank you both for coming on and everybody thank you all for watching hit the like button hit the subscribe button lastly check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support what i'm doing here and also get access to extra content see you later god bless oh wait before you go i would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel this is my primary means to provide for my family and it also helps me to produce content like this video if you would like to support me become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology you'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.